I'm going to go to Psalm chapter 1. Oh, good luck, camera crew. Psalm chapter 1 and give you a little insight to Spiritual Emphasis Week. If you're with me, say yeah. This is, this is what it says. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Everybody say walk. Hey, even our kids over here, say walk. Everybody in this section right here, say walk. I see you. All right, how about our, everybody in the middle? Y'all say walk. Hey, stick with me here. Hey, every single one of y'all are in the middle of pursuing something. Hey, I'm going to give y'all a second. Bring it in. There we go. Oh, it's chapel. It's spiritual emphasis week. I think that's why everybody's so excited. Hey, everybody's in, in the middle of pursuing something. And everybody's just about to take a next step this week towards something. I know some of y'all are already looking at spiritual emphasis week so excited for what God's got planned. I know some of y'all have never heard of spiritual emphasis week before. And if some of us have our own expectations, some of us think of, man, we got more chapels. Maybe we got more time to do what we want on this. Y'all, please don't miss this. God has really big things planned for each and every one of y'all. He's got big things planned to speak to you through Big Al. He's been looking forward to connecting with y'all all this week. I want you to think about this. What is my next step towards Jesus? What is your next step towards Jesus? What is the one thing God's calling me to? What's the one thing that God's putting on my heart? What's the thing God's been pulling me in his direction? Maybe I've been giving him a stiff arm and saying, I'm, I'm avoiding it, Lord. Because when we're going to get into worship, let's not get into normal, mundane, routine, I'm standing up because I have to. Let's really seek the Lord this week and say, God, whatever you got for me, I'm listening. I'm going to let you know this coming Friday night... It's a response time for Spiritual Emphasis Week. We're calling it Sunset Circle. And we're going to have the sun set on this week with all of us going around and sharing that one step of faith that God challenged us to take. If you're with me, say yeah. If you're ready to worship, stand to your feet. And the worship team's going to take it away. Almighty God, would you help us? God, would you help us get out of our routine? Would you help us to look at this week and to look at your word and to look at this worship like you've got something special planned for us? Lord, would you help us to be interested in what you have planned? God, I know we have so many things that we want when we come in this place, when we show up in here. God, sometimes we look at you like it is our will that you're supposed to do. And Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. We know that nothing in this life matters if we haven't surrendered our lives to you. And God, we ask that our next step that we're talking about all throughout this week, would you help us to take this next step of obedience with you? Lord, would you help us to walk your way? Would you help us to live out our purpose? Would you help us to seek your will and your kingdom first and know that everything else is added? We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.
doors fling wide I see glory as I run inside your throne room before you I bow the veil is torn the doors fling wide I see glory as I run inside your throne room for you I bow to worship together. Thank you for the beginning of spiritual emphasis, and we pray that the speaker will put will have a good message, and everyone has a good rest of their day. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Man, we're going to start this week off worshiping, huh? Well, uh, golly, I'm so excited. You know, uh, this is this is a special one for me, even as we've been planning this with your faculty and with Big Al. We've been, we've been cooking on spiritual emphasis week for about six months. And so we've been praying for y'all. We've been in so many different meetings, praying for God to work in your life. So I hope you don't miss it. You know, um, something that's kind of cool, you know, Big Al, when he comes to a school like this, especially, I don't know if y'all realize this, but when speakers, when this is what you're called to do, the big nerves in your stomach or something like that isn't, man, I hope I, I hope they like me or I hope I do a good job or whatever it is. The big excitement piece is I really can't wait to see what God does in these kids' lives. And, and that's, I, I'll let y'all know just from who Big Al is, he's been thinking about y'all and praying about y'all on, in that for months. This is actually when he spoke here in chapel about a year ago. Once he left, we started these conversations because one of the things that he does with a lot of the private schools that he works with is spiritual emphasis weeks. To think that somebody can specialize in that is a little bit funny, but uh, it's just so cool seeing that God can work in somebody's life that way. And so from, he's not just a, a speaker this week, but he is here to shepherd and minister all week. If he was already in your class this morning, raise your hand. I'm curious. Yeah, he's already been in classes, and you won't be able to keep him out of them. You know, he'll probably pull you aside and start a conversation with you because this isn't just something that he's doing this week. This is a big part of who he is and who God created him to be. So will y'all please give a warm Christian unified welcome to Algernon Tennyson. Good morning. Good morning. Um, what an honor to be here and to serve you guys. Get ready. We're going to have some church this week. I'm telling y'all now. And um, God is good, and, and I have been so excited to get here. Look, if you got your Bibles, go ahead and go into Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. As we're talking about taking next steps, 
That's assuming there's a foundation. And I've learned this, we get in trouble when we assume things. So we're talking about next step and, and, and going deeper and deeper with the Lord because if we know Him, then it all boils down to do we love Him? And if you don't get this basis of Christianity, you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle because God always assumes that this, this is twofold. To love God is to love people. To understand God is to love people. And if you don't get this, you're going to struggle with Christianity because you're going to end up thinking it's about you. <laughs> you're going to have a real big struggle if all you're waiting for God to do is help you get into college, help you lose some weight. Help you have a good GPA. Help your marriage, your church, your finances. You're going to struggle with Christianity because grace and selfishness are like oil and water. They don't mix. They don't mix. And if all you want is God's stuff but you don't want him, that's called a sugar daddy. When you want his stuff but you don't really care much for him, you're going to struggle. You're going to struggle immensely. And when we hear the word love in our culture, it's just all mushy and sappy, all mm -hmm. and, the, and when God talks about love, it's, it's not less than your emotions, but it's surely more than. It can't just be this emotional feelings. Don't mistake your feelings and your hormones for the Holy Spirit. They will lead you down some very dangerous paths. So when God says well, love them, it's more than just how you feel. Think about it. Before Jesus was to be scourged, he said, Father, if you can take this cup from me, nevertheless, he said, your will be done. That means Jesus passed. He went way beyond emotions and goosebumps. When the emotion wasn't there, his commitment was there. <laughs> So when we say Americans, we think love, we think as long as I feel it, that's love. But true love is saying even when I don't feel great about who you are, I'm not going anywhere. I'm here. Love says I'm committed to you when the goosebumps aren't there, when you don't look so good all the time, when you're getting on my nerve and I want to choke you out. <laughs> I'm still here. I'm not going anywhere. Love is a commitment way more than it's about your feelings. Quit making Christianity be about this goosebumpy feelings. Sometimes doing the right thing has very little to do with how you feel about it. I'm going to do it because it's the right thing to do. Because it's what I should do. And Lord, let my feelings catch up with my faith later. And this is what he's telling us. Listen to what he says here in Mark chapter 12. Let's pray once more, and we're going to dig in this word. Father, we love you. <laughs> because you have first loved us. Father, teach us what it means to go to the next step with you. Take our walk with you to a deeper intimacy. We need you more than the air we are breathing. Father, help me rightly divide your word this morning. Speak to the hearts of these precious young people that you have given your all for. May I not sell them short. May I not sell your word short. We need you and we love you. It's in the beautiful and the matchless name of Jesus that we pray. And all of my chocolate, white chocolate, and caramel brothers and sisters, say it. Amen. Amen. Come on, come on. If you got your Bibles, let's go. Mark chapter 12, Mark chapter 12. Verse 29, this is Jesus talking. And listen to these beautiful, beautiful, beautiful words that our Savior says. And Jesus answered him saying, the first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then this is what I want us to focus on, verse 30 and 31. You've heard these, but do you know them? And you shall love the Lord your God with all your what? Your heart. Love with all your heart. This is more than just emotions. It's where you get your desires. It's where you get your passions. The Bible says that Jesus is coming back for a bride. He's not coming back for a girlfriend. A girlfriend can be a hookup, but you can boot her tomorrow. I'm not trying to create some cute little boyfriends and girlfriends. Matter of fact, I could care less about your boyfriend and your girlfriends. I'm trying to create some future husbands and wives in this place. Because God's all about commitment. So when he says love me with your heart, 
This idea is you go back in the Old Testament, there's a story about a guy named Hosea. He's an incredibly anointed prophet, man of God. God made him marry a girl named Gomer. She was a prostitute. The idea is that God is the greater Hosea. He's faithful. Even when we're Gomers, we're choosing sin, and we're cheating on him all the time. The idea is that his heart was there. Gomer, Hosea was faithful even when his brat was stepping out on him. The idea was he was at home working hard, taking care of the kids, raising kids that probably weren't even his. No matter how much she was choosing sin, he was never going to choose anything above her because his heart was in it, Pastor. See, when your heart's in it, don't mean it always feels good. You're going to do what's right because your heart's in it. He goes, so love them with your heart. <laughs> Love them with your heart. Give them your commitment. Give them your passions. Why? Because he's demonstrated it for you. Romans 5, 8 said, while you were yet a sinner, he died for you. God didn't wait for you to start going to Christian school and doing right. When you were at your most shady, he gave you the best that he could give you. He demonstrated his love for you, for you that while you were yet a sinner, he died for you. His heart was in it. <laughs> it wasn't just emotions. They drug him through the streets like a criminal. Y'all, they crucified him at, at Golgotha, Calvary. It was where you went to dump your trash, by the way, if y'all didn't know that. It wasn't the most glorious place to die. They didn't just crucify Jesus. They crucified him in a dumping ground. They humiliated him. And the Bible says not even despising the shame. Jesus' heart was committed to you to where he was even willing to be shamed and mocked so that your sin wouldn't have to shame and mock you. Come on. Brother, can I walk at all? I know y'all trying to video, but I'm a different speaker. I need to walk. This might mess your production up, but I'm after your hearts. COVID kept us too far from each other. I'm trying to get close to some folk. Love them with all your heart. He was committed to you. And no matter what you did, he wasn't going to choose anything over you because you have his heart. See, and if God has your heart, then you'll quit letting people determine how you treat them. Christ determines how I treat you, brother. You don't. Because he has my heart. You had his heart. You are the only thing God let his son leave heaven for. He was at the right hand of his father. God let Jesus leave his right hand, come to the earth as a baby who needed his diaper changed. The only thing Christ humbled himself for and died on the cross for is you. There's nothing more precious in this room than human beings. You had God's heart. That means you had his commitment. And nothing, nothing was going to throw him off from that. Nothing was going to throw him off from that because you had his heart. So even when you weren't doing right, he was going to do right by you. See, some of y'all are waiting to love people based on if they love you back. You don't need to be a Christian to love somebody that way. And if Christ really has your heart, <clears throat> then you'll quit waiting for people to deserve your heart. And you'll give it to them because God has given you his. So today's message is, and I hope your bullies get a taste of their medicine. No, I hope they get a taste of God's medicine. I hope you love people who aren't loving you. I hope you're kind to people who aren't being kind to you because Christ has your heart. Quit waiting for people to deserve it and give it to them because Christ is worthy. One amen in the whole room. Thank you, sister. That's why we're struggling in our faith. Y'all keep waiting for karma. Christians don't believe in no karma. They ain't waiting on you to love me, for me to love you. I don't care if you like me, that I'm tall and I'm beautifully chocolate. I don't care if you like that or not. It isn't about you, it's about him. You get to choose how you're going to treat me, but Christ is telling me how to treat you. He's giving you his heart. I better give you mine. It doesn't matter if you're a good student or a bad student, you're a rebellious one or an obedient one. My God was obedient all the way to death on that cross to redeem you. You think you're going to throw me off my game because you're rebellious and you're angry and you're bitter? You better keep on trying. Christ has went through too much for us to give up on some disheartened, disgruntled, angry teenager. Christ is, he's bare too much for us to quit on you. Quit quitting on people based on their behavior. Your behavior is not greater than your Savior. He gave you his heart. 
And no matter what you were doing, Christ made it all the way to Calvary for you. He was not going to let anything stop him from giving you a chance at redemption. So y'all going to, teachers going to let some disgruntled teenager throw you off your game? Don't you dare. Don't you dare. Quit looking at their behavior. God is greater than. He's greater than. Quit letting people throw us off our game. Christ has went through too much. Listen to this. He goes, love them with all your heart, with all your soul. It's where we get our emotions, our affections. That means God didn't want us just tolerating him. You don't want that. Can you imagine Pastor Grant proposing to his wife? He says, baby, will you marry me? And she said, well, nobody else wanted me. So I guess so. I don't want to be a bridesmaid forever. Nobody's making a Hallmark movie around that ghetto proposal. <laughs> You want to snotting up his shirt and everything. Why? Well, you want to know that she actually likes him. He ain't just tolerating him because I don't want to be single forever. We don't like God just tolerating us. The Bible says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He didn't reluctantly redeem you. That's a man who went after his bride. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He wasn't passionate about the cross. He created the wood that the cross was made after. It was his bride he was passionate about. Even though she was sending it up, living in the world, chasing sin, which we all do, he passionately redeemed us. He didn't reluctantly say, well, I guess if I got to die for these losers. <laughs> he passionately redeemed us. So yes, God wants you to like him. It shouldn't be an oxymoron for Christians to like Christ. Some of y'all are like, you just tolerating Jesus, and you wonder why nobody wants to go to church or, or, or school with you. You're like, well, come to school with us, and you too can be a Christian. You can be as miserable as we are, but at least we ain't going to hell, brother. None of us likes Jesus. We're just tolerating him. Yeah. Who's going to be excited about that? You don't seem to be excited about it. How are you going to convince someone of something that you don't even seem to like? How are you going to convince someone of something that you don't even seem convinced in? We just tolerate lowly Jesus. We ain't got a third option. It's Jesus or the devil. Is that third option? He gave you his soul. The Bible said, what's it matter if a man gains the whole world and forfeits his? His soul. His soul. Your soul is the, is the foundation of everything you do. Your behavior is not your issue. It's not. That's a symptom. What you do is a symptom of who you really are. Does God have your heart and your soul? That's the root of your issues. Your behavior is not. Listen to this. Listen to what he says. He goes, love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your what? Your mind. You'll never do anything you don't think about first. You are transformed by the renewing of your? You are transformed by the renewing of your? You're transformed by the renewing of your mind. You want to change what you're doing, you better change what you're thinking. Because if you keep thinking the same, you're going to keep doing the same. If God don't have your mind, he'll never have your heart and your soul. That's why we preach this harp on y'all all the time. about Get in the Word, get in the Word, stand in the Scriptures, read the Bible. Y'all think, oh, here they are again. Because we realize it's crazy acting, asking you to change your behavior without changing how you think. We're setting you up to fail. That's why most people maybe don't want you dating their children because they're not judging you. You're letting them know what you're going to do when you get along with their children. Because if you ain't renewing your mind when you by yourself, what you going to do with my daughter? If you ain't renewing your mind now, I'm not judging you. You're telling me what y'all going to do. You ain't going to lead her to no Bible study if you ain't having one by yourself. So I'm not judging you. You're telling me exactly what you're going to do with my child. If you ain't letting God renew your mind now as a single young lady, what you going to do when you get together with my son? You're going to wreck him. All in the name of your hormones. Brother Graham, I don't know if y'all going to ever invite me back again. But I'm trying to keep this thing real. I'm trying to play church. Y'all know how to play church. I'm trying for us to really be the church. A bunch of imperfect people serving a righteous and holy God. That's what we are. And if you aren't renewing your mind now, what y'all going to do when y'all get together? 
Don't be judging people's parents that they aren't excited about them being with you because you haven't shown them any ounce of fruit. And so what kind of fruit you could, look, y'all, the idea, y'all know that in the, in, the, in the New Testament there's 29 books, 27 of them mention bearing fruit. That means 90% of the New Testament books mention bearing fruit. You might want to bear some. And if you ain't loving God with your mind, he doesn't have your heart and your soul. And if you ain't loving God with your mind, how are you going to love somebody else with it? You're just going to use them. Because if you aren't giving God your heart and your mind, you've got to give it to somebody. Somebody's got to be Jesus if it ain't the real Jesus. You need somebody to fill that void. And if you aren't renewing your mind, you're bringing people into your struggles with you. The best thing you can do for your future spouse is notice I keep, I ain't saying nothing about no boyfriend, girlfriend, because I could care less. I'm going to keep echoing that. I could care less if your boyfriends and girlfriends in this room don't like me. I hope every one of you invites me to your future wedding. I'm thinking about your husbands and your wives right now. If you aren't renewing your mind right now, you're setting everybody else up to fail you. Because there ain't no boy, no girl so fine, so cute, so awesome that they can give you what you need. Thank you. <laughs> there ain't nobody out there that awesome. No spouse, no husband, no preacher, not me, not Dr. Jeremiah, not Grant. None of us can, can give you everything you need. You can make a cult around us if that's the case. You better renew your mind because it's the most precious thing God has given you. And if you aren't renewing it, good luck on everything else in your life working out. Matter of fact, even when it comes to sports, academics, anything, we always say, get your mind right. I used to play basketball, and you could always tell if a guy had a fight with his girlfriend because it'd throw him off during the game. I'd be like, bro, what are you thinking about right now? He'd be thinking about that fight they just had. And because his mind wasn't right, it threw his playoff on the court. Coaches always focus on working out and stuff. If you're a coach in here, you need to focus on spiritual and emotional coaching just as much as you do physical. This is, your generation sees it different. My generation, in basketball, we thought it was a guy, his name was Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan said on game day, he wouldn't even take calls from his wife. He'd go, baby, unless you, somebody's dying, don't call me. Because he had to get his mind in the right place. That's why they said he had ice in his vein, because he was thinking about nothing else but what he had to that task right there. And if we need to do the same thing in our minds, say, Lord, I, my issue isn't my behavior. My issue is my mind. Because we want to blame. We're, we're the American. We're Americans. We blame everybody for what, what's wrong with us. If something's wrong with you, mama didn't cook enough cookies. Daddy worked too many hours. My coach didn't favor me. That's why he put me on a varsity team. We never own anything. And if you ain't renewing your mind, you'll spend your whole life blaming everybody else for what you're not. Even if you have a friend that encouraged you to do something shady, they didn't, they're not 100% fault for your stronghold. Let me give an example. Say you end up going to a counselor someday, and you say, man, I, I didn't start drinking until I was in high school. One of my buddies invited me to a, a shady party, and I never drank. My parents would have never allowed me to drink or vape or smoke. And then you're sitting in front of Oprah, Dr. Phil, whoever else is telling you it's everybody else's fault why you messed up. You got at least own 50% of it because your friends may encourage you to a party, but they never forced that substance down your throat. They may have brought what was inside of you to the surface, but you got to own up that if I don't renew my mind, matter of fact, write this down right now what I'm saying. I'm about to say something that if you're taking notes, write it down later. Your biggest enemy in life will be you. Nobody will ever hurt you more than you will. Because if you don't renew your mind and get a right understanding of who you are in Christ, you give people way too much power to control who you are. So yeah, they encourage you to sin and stumble, but they didn't make you. You got to own at least 50% of it was that you weren't where you should have been. Because if you knew who you were, you could have said no every single time. But because your mind wasn't renewed in Christ, you gave them all the power to control what you do. People are never 100% at fault for who we are. They're partially, but we got to own some of it. But we're Americans. We don't want to own anything. It's everybody else's fault while I'm messed up. I'm black, you white, you rich, I'm poor, you educated, I'm not, you Democrat, I'm Republican. You, I mean, we can come here all day and kumbaya it. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Y'all know it is. 
We don't want to own anything. And then we get saying, God says, quit blaming everybody. You got the king of kings dwelling in your heart. There's nothing you can't do. But it starts with renewing your mind. Mm -hmm. I could focus on this one, Brother Grant, all day. Because if you're renewing your mind, good luck on everything else. Good luck. He says, love with your heart, your soul, and your mind, especially young people. Nothing but teenagers in here. Y'all got hormones popping out your eyeballs. You better give God your mind. Because if you ain't giving God your mind, instead of you leaving a trail of blessing, you're going to leave a trail of destruction behind you. Because if this ain't right, ain't nothing else going to be right following it. We keep focusing on your anger and your lust and you're watching inappropriate images and all those are just symptoms. They aren't the reason why. You aren't thinking lustful things just to think lustful things. You ain't putting the right things in your mind. The Bible says take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Y'all better learn to do that. Y'all want to know how I prayed this morning? I've been praying the same prayer since I was 17 years old and this is exactly how I prayed it. Father, thank you for waking me up. Help me not blow it today. Amen. There's my big old fancy theological prayer for you. And every day, God delivers me. Every day, I had to get in the Word. And every day, I had to ask God to renew my mind. Because it didn't matter if I had a great day yesterday. I could blow it today. My deliverance is daily. Yours has to be also. Come on. Are y'all with me? Oh, we're going to have some fun. I'm feeling good now. Seek with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Everything that's sing you, strength, that means you, it doesn't come easy. You got to give it to them. Love them with all your strength. Meaning, the Bible says that salvation is a free gift. We don't believe in work based salvation. We're Christians. We ain't Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. We believe we're saved by grace. Okay? We're saved by grace. But intimacy is not free. That's giving God your strength. That's saying, Lord, that ain't easy. You got to work that out. You're going to get strong. You got to work out. Say y'all got a football team, but y'all football players never lift weights. Y'all are going to get thumped all over the field. Strength don't just come. Some of you have natural strength, but if you want to be stronger, you do what? You do push-ups. You lift weights. You work out. You do curls. You do clings. You don't just get there. Nobody gets in shape from just sitting on the couch eating potato chips. Strength is putting some effort in it, meaning God is saying, look, I'll do everything to save you, but if you want to grow deeper in love with me, you got to put some effort in that. There's no thing in the Bible that says God's given some a gift to love them more than others. You'll never find that passage in any of the Bible. You'll never find it. You'll never find one passage, and God has given some the gift to love them more than others. Every Christian was saved the exact same way. Jesus is blood on the cross, and we said, yes, we repent it. But the, the depth in which you love God is based on how much you're willing to give up your strength for his. How much you're willing to seek after that. Salvation is a free gift, but intimacy is not. Salvation is a free gift from the Lord, but intimacy is not free. He don't just give that. You got to seek after his heart. Salvation comes to anyone who will say yes to it and repent. Lord, you did all the work. But the depth in which I love you, now that's on me. That's on me. Am I willing to surrender everything I have? So strength, biblical strength comes in you surrendering your weakness, not in you flexing. Are y'all hear me? Weakness has never caused anyone to fall. Pride has. Weakness has never caused anyone to fall. Pride has. The Bible says God shows himself in our weakness. His love is made perfect through and in our weakness. God seems to be more tender when we can admit the more weak we are. Your weakness would never have been the issue in your, intimacy, your lack of intimacy with Christ. Your pride has been. You're too prideful to admit you're weak. And God will let you hold on to that white knuckle, hold on to that pride and wreck yourself. Or you can say, Lord, I'm just weak. Wish I could date better, but I keep doing the same things. Wish I was more patient, but I keep being impatient. Wish I had more godly thoughts, but I keep thinking ungodly things. God's saying, I'll set you free when you admit that you can't set you free. You get freedom when you finally admit you can't bring freedom. He can. 
You can't love the Lord all your heart, all your soul, all your might, all your strength on your own, but he can. You couldn't save yourself, but he did. You can't overcome anything, but he has. There's freedom in realizing you can't bring the freedom. He can. He brings it. That's how we're going to go deeper. Realizing I can't do it. And God's just been waiting for you to surrender and say, yes, Lord, no to you and yes to him. I can't do it, God said, finally, now I can do it. And then last but not least, listen to this. And this is the second. You should love your as. That's not an arrogant verse, by the way. Love your neighbors yourself. He ain't talking about thinking, no. He said, until you learn to love the Lord, you'll never learn to love people properly. He starts out with a relationship with him, and then he says it all accumulates to this. There are two commandments. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Then you can truly love your neighbors, which is what the church just calls evangelism. It's evangelism. It's discipleship. It's, it's the gospel wrapped up in the whole. What is the essence of the gospel? God changes one to change one. He saves my soul, not just so that I can be happy that I'm a Christian, but so that I can bear fruit, and maybe God can use my life to bring someone else into faith with him. So Jesus is saying, you'll know how much you love me by how much you love your neighbor. He didn't say where you went to school, where you went to seminary, who your pastor, how big your church is. Can't care less how many scriptures you can quote if you're a jerk. Did y'all hear that? I could care less where you go to school and who your pastor is and how many scriptures you can quote if you don't know how to love anybody. Nobody cares. Do you know apologetics and Hebrew and Greek and you went to seminary? Nobody cares if you're a jerk. I'll tell you, God will say, you really love me? He'll say, then feed my sheep. We can sit up here all day and say we love Jesus. God says, let me see how you treat your classmate. Because not a one of you will take your little iPhone out there and throw it on the ground and stump on it, but you'll stump on somebody's heart that's made in the image of God. You don't understand the gospel. You care more about your GPA than you does that person's heart that's sitting beside you every day in class. But as long as you got good grades, you'll sleep like a baby. You care less that person's miserable. They hate themselves. They don't like life. But you don't care. Your life's good. You don't understand the gospel. You may be religious. You may know some verses, but you don't really love God. You'll know you love God by how you love your neighbor. God ain't physically here, but you are, my brother. God ain't physically here, but you are. God's not physically here, but you are. I can sit up here all day and say I love God. He's going to say, show me in my creation. Well, I do love you. Show me right now. Every day, God's given every one of us an opportunity to show him how much we love him back. Next time you run into a Christian that says they're bored, you're running into someone who, first of all, may not be one, because everywhere I look, somebody's hurting and broken. And every day, God's given me an opportunity to show my love and back for what he did on the cross for me. Christians should never be bored. Everywhere I look, somebody struggling with their sexuality, struggling with their image, struggling with their health, struggling with their appearance, struggling with their grades, struggling with their marriage. Everywhere I look, somebody's struggling with something. We should never get bored unless we thought it was about us. That's why some of you struggle with Christian school. It, you, you struggle with this school because you wanted it all to be about you. You struggle with Christianity because you wait for God to hook your circumstances up. When's the last time you lost any sleep asking God to bless anyone other than yourself? When's the last time you wept because your classmate wasn't as happy as you were? When's the last time you wept because somebody had low self-esteem and they didn't like themselves? When's the last time you wept that somebody else's parents were going through a hard time in their marriage? When's the last time you wept because you saw somebody sit by themselves because they didn't like who they were, how they looked, how, who, where they lived? When's the last time you asked God, don't you send another blessing my way until you bless them first? Don't you bless, don't you answer another prayer of mine until you bless them? Don't you send another check to this church until you bless that one down the road that's barely got anybody coming? Don't you bless my marriage with anything else until you help my brother and his wife overcome their issues. Don't you do it. When's the last time you wept because somebody else was weeping? When? 
The Bible says if you're faithful in little, you'll be faithful in much. If you can't serve God as a broke teenager without a high school diploma, what makes you think you're going to serve him when you're making big money? You can't serve him now. You won't serve him when you've got college degrees and stuff. You'll just have fancier cars and RVs and we won't ever see you. You better learn to give him now. Give him everything while you got a little. So that God knows if I bring you much, you're just going to keep on serving me by serving others. But if you can't serve the Lord now because your life ain't perfect, you ain't going to serve the Lord later as your life gets better. You'll find more and more reasons to be self-absorbed into yourself. You better learn to love the Lord. And love the Lord, learning to love the Lord ends up accumulating with loving others. With loving others. With loving others. With loving others. I'm on a mission this week. And I said it to Dr. Jeremiah last year when we talked about doing this. I said, I ain't the best preacher you can bring in here, but I love relationship. And I will love on every kid you allow me to even look at. Because Jesus has paid too great a price for us to give up on you. So if you don't like yourself in this room, show me what passage of Scripture you get that from. Where's that at? Show me, what, show me that in your Bible. Well, I don't like me. I'm a loser. What verse is that? I ain't rich enough. I ain't the right ethnicity. I ain't the right height, the right look, the right. Show me that. And if you can't show it to me in the scriptures, then I'm not going to believe it as truth. And the Bible says you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you. The truth doesn't put you and keep you in bondage, but it breaks bondage. Come on, who am I talking to? I'm sick and tired of teenagers hating on themselves. These are the best years of your life, and some of y'all right here moping like, like you're some 80-year-old with a bad back. Some of y'all sucked the life out of me, and I'm old enough to be your parent. No longer. They shouldn't have brought me here this week. Now you're on my turf. <laughs> Consider this thing like Christian, like Christian mafia. Once you get in, you can't get out. Oh, yeah, you're on our turf now. Mope all you want. Your parents shouldn't have brought you here. You're getting loved on this week. And if that leads you to counseling, then so be it. Oh, that Christian was telling me how much God loves me. Go on. Go see Oprah with that. Okay. We're going to keep loving you because now you're on my turf. You're on my turf. And we're fixing to tell you about a God who absolutely adored you, where he gave everything for you. Listen to this as I close, because some of you are having a hard time believing what I'm saying, because you don't even, it's hard for you to believe God loves you when that guy you want to go to the prom with don't notice you. It's hard for you to believe God loves you when you don't even love you. So we preachers come in and say, God loves you. He died on the cross. You're like, whatever, man. I don't even think people at the school all notice me. And you're going to tell me a God who set the stars in place noticed me? Yes, I am. That's exactly what I'm going to tell you. Because I'm going to tell you that his word reigns truer than anyone else's word. What he says is ultimate truth. Not what I say, not what anyone else says. What he says reigns truth. So even if you don't believe it, it doesn't stop it from being the truth. He loves you. He adores you. And so Jesus can easily turn around and say to us, if you love me, because he's already proven his love for me. He, my grandfather had a saying, and y'all heard it. He said, grandson, talk is cheap. Jesus talked a big talk, but he walked a big, an even bigger walk. When push came to shove, he demonstrated his love, and he carried that cross to Calvary, and they stretched him high in a junkyard humiliated him. They stripped him down to his birthday suit, by the way, if you really study it. They mocked him, humiliated him, and he still said, give me that cross. They were asking, saying, you still want to die for these fools? Paul said, I can let you go. That was his way of saying, you got to die for these idiots? And Jesus said, what are you talking about? That's my bride. Don't you dare call her that again. Give me that cross. Pluck out my beard. Rip my skin off my back. Mock me the whole way to Calvary. Mock me even while I'm on the cross. And I'm going to finish what I started. I'm going to redeem my bride. I loved her to the end. And I will always love her to the end. And nothing you can do and say that's going to throw me off my game. I am a committed man. My heart is in this. And I love my bride. Pray with me. Father, thank you. Man, you're good. 
Your spirit is in this house, Lord. Your spirit is in the house, Lord. And thank you for loving us when we can be so unlovable. Thank you for being faithful when I know I can surely be unfaithful, Father. Thank you for being true. And thank you for demonstrating to us that you loved us first. Maybe you're in this room right now and you go, Big Al, I don't know this guy. Yeah, I'm in a Christian school. I've heard it before. But maybe you've never surrendered to Christ. And you say, Big Al, just pray for me. I'm not even convinced I'm a child of God. Or maybe you're convinced that you are not a child of God. And you just say, Big Al, just pray for me. For sake of time, i got to move. And if you will, if you just say, Big Al, pray for me. I, 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 need to, I need a relationship with Jesus. If I died at this moment, I know I am not a child of God. But I know he's offering me that. The Bible says it's, it's his goodness that leads us to repentance. That says it's his wrath. His goodness leads us to repentance. God is offering you himself. He's saying, trade your sin for his sacrifice on the cross. Your sin will never be greater than his shed blood. Will you say yes to Jesus? If that is you and you just say, Big Al, pray for me, I, I need to surrender to Jesus. Will you slip up a hand real quick where I can see it? Come on, come on. Is there anybody across the room? Thank you. Come on. Say, Big Al, pray for me. Thank you. I see you. I see you. Come on. Anybody else? Thank you. Come on. Say, pray for me. I need to surrender my life to Jesus. Thank you. I see you up there too, young man. Thank you. That's awesome. I see you there. Come on. Anybody else say, pray? Just, I'm just going to pray for you. Thank you. Anybody else say, pray for me. I need to surrender to the Lord. Come on. Thank you. I see you there, darling. That's awesome. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Father, yes. I see you too. Thank you. Father, I just want to lift up these young people to you. And for those whose hands are raised, there's no magical prayer, no magical anything that can save them. Repentance does. What you did on the cross has saved us. And Lord, just raising their hands is their way of saying, I know I'm a sinner. And Lord, when I mess up with my wife or with you, I know how to say I'm sorry. Lord, and I pray in their own ways, they would just let you know how sorry they are for their sins, but how grateful they are that you died on the cross for those sins. And that from this day forth, Lord, if they repent of their sins, they can be children of God and never doubt their salvation because you are guarding it yourself. And Lord, for those of us who are Christian, we know that we know we belong to you. Help us, Father, renew, renew the joy of our salvation. Help us not to take our sin lightly. Help us to take every thought captive that is not of you. Any ungodly thought, unhealthy thought, may we not just tolerate it. If you are able to save our souls, what else can you not do for us? You've already done the greatest thing you'll ever do in giving your broken body and shed blood for us. What else can we not ask you for? We love you, Father because you loved us first. Bless us as we go throughout this day. Help us to be mindful to love you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength, because you have loved us first with all of those attributes. You are a good God. Now teach us to love you back. It's in the beautiful, in the matchless name of Jesus that we pray. And all of my chocolate, white chocolate, and caramel brothers and sisters say it. God bless you. God bless you. And may the Lord bless you. Anybody excited for Spiritual Emphasis Week yet? Here, before we get on to the rest of it, I know Big Al was just praying for you. I want to give you all just about 30 seconds, so close your eyes, bow your heads. Just whatever it is you feel like you need to pray to God, pray it to Him. I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to give you just a little bit of time. Take care of whatever business you need to take care of with the Lord. Oh, we need you, Lord.
We can't do any of these things that Big Al's been talking about. We can't show love without you. We know that your kind of love is only expressed when we have a relationship with you first. And so, Lord, as so many of us, I see it in our eyes, I see it in this place, so many of us have something that we feel like you've put on our hearts. God, please help us not to tuck it under our seats and come and get it tomorrow. Help us to take what you put on our hearts with us to lunch. Lord, would you help us to take these next steps of obedience that you put on our hearts? Lord, we realize that about a dozen people just surrender their life to you already as we begin this week. And would you help us to see that our next conversations with them, not even knowing who they are, matter so much. Because they need to be strengthened. They need to be encouraged by their Christian brothers and sisters around them. Lord, let this not be spiritual emphasis hour. But Lord, would you help this to be spiritual emphasis week as we take these next steps of obedience with whatever you're putting on our heart. God, even when we get done here, would you help us to take those steps of boldness, even praying for our food with our friends around, offering to say, hey, I'm going to show love this way. When we have that, that pressure on our, in our minds to make that joke or whatever it is, to act like our old self, God, we know that there's at least a dozen people in here that have new selves, that new men, that they need to act that way. Lord, would you give us strength to do that? Would you help us to take these next steps of love, like you love us? I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all, let's do that, huh? Y'all ready to go do that? Can't wait. We got a big week planned. It is rainy day lunch. So whatever that means for you, oh my gosh. Oh, my goodness. Look, Big Al, look at this. You're talking about God's love. I say rainy day lunch. They say, oh, wow. Let's try this. God loves you. And it's rainy day lunch, so do what you did for that last week. See you all tomorrow. You're dismissed.